Welcome to the Hey Chaplain podcast. My name is Jared Altick, and I'm a chaplain with the police department. This podcast is for cops and for everyone interested in law enforcement culture, careers, and wellness. On Hey Chaplain, you'll hear from dispatchers and federal agents, sheriffs and U.S. Marshals, as well as the occasional social media personality like Mike the Cop. From the LAPD to Scotland Yard, the guests on Hey Chaplain share their own experiences so that police officers everywhere can survive and thrive. Today I'm talking with Sergeant Toby Wolf. She is a patrol sergeant here in Kansas City and has been the most requested interview among my local Kansas City listeners. Sergeant Wolf and I talk about injuries, how she became a cop, some advice for women going into law enforcement, and advice about dating and getting married to another cop. Make sure you listen to the end to catch how the chaplain keeps embarrassing her. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this one. Here's Toby Wolf. Toby, how are you today? I'm doing good, hobbling along. (laughs) <laughs> so to speak. Yes, yes, you're on light duty these days, aren't you? Currently, yeah. yeah. I've been on light duty for, I think, going on like two and a half weeks now. Okay, okay. So the dreaded knee surgery. There's been more than one cop that's had something like that, right? Right. Yeah. It's been a process, <laughs> about a six month process. Oh, mercy, mercy sakes. So. Uh, did you get injured on? At work, or was it something at home? I did. No, um, back in May, I actually picked up a shift on one of my regular days off uh, to come in and help with. That was staffing. your first mistake. That yeah. was yeah. my first mistake. <laughs> yes, on a Saturday, no less. And about midday, I'd actually just sat down after cooking my lunch, mm-hmm. and I happened to look up at the computer, and I like to see what's going on throughout the city throughout the day, mm-hmm. and I saw that there was a lost juvenile call out in the west uh, west end side of town. Okay. And so I clicked on it just to read the call notes to see what was going on, and as I started reading further down on our CAD, which is our computer system, I saw that... Somebody was following a stolen car that had a kid inside of it. So I got oh, on the radio. Oh, I know this. Okay. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So I got on the radio and I asked dispatch to confirm if that was true and they were following the vehicle because it was coming into the division in the area that I patrol on the highway that you could literally see right outside my office windows. Mm-hmm. So after... Uh, probably a few seconds or so dispatch confirmed that they were following the vehicle and there was a couple other officers inside with me having lunch and we all hopped in our cars and got out up on the highway and by the grace of God, we ended up finding this vehicle right as we got in the area. We actually went into vehicle pursuit of it. Yeah. So one of the roles that I have as a supervisor is obviously to monitor that and um, approve that so my officers can continue to chase that and hopefully get the car stopped and get the kid back. And it went into Missouri. And while they were in Missouri, um, one of the major highways that they have over there is 71 Highway. And... I was a little bit further behind, um, just trying to monitor it because Mm -hmm. should it stop over there, I have to go to that termination point. Mm -hmm. And they ended up getting off the highway and coming back on. So we were actually getting ready to cross paths on the highway. And this was the first opportunity that I think any agency had to set up stop sticks for the car. Right. And flatten their tires. Flatten their tires, throw out the stop sticks, um, hopefully get it stopped slowly, safely. And um, as I was getting out of the car, I grabbed my sticks and I hopped up onto the center median of the highway and I planted my kneecap into the pavement. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, there's that injury. Yeah. So um, I've been dealing with that for about the last six months. And I should say that... I was not able to stick the car. Oh, no. Uh, I was not able to stick it. Um, I obviously didn't judge the distance between the center divider and the actual lane of traffic that he was in because they had a very wide center median okay. area. So I didn't realize you were across the state line when Yeah, that we happened. were in Missouri. Okay. Did the car get stopped back on our side? It did. We okay. actually chased it, I think, an additional maybe 20 to 25 minutes after that incident. and So you're injured in Missouri. Correct. And I hopped right back over, back in my car. Oh, and really? Yes. I okay. was was I was feeling it. But you know, oh, you get man. that adrenaline dump. Yeah, right. And you don't necessarily feel it as bad. Right. Um, and so they chased it another twenty minutes and our uh SOU guys or our SWAT team right. 
happened to be out working the NASCAR races that day because we had that really big event going on that weekend. And they were listening to the radio. So they ended up leaving that event Mm -hmm. and were able to uh, join in in the pursuit in our city back when they came into our city. And they had recently, gosh, I don't know, maybe a month or two prior to that, um, got certified in a TVI, which is, I guess, what other people call like a pit maneuver. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, One car, the cop car bumps the other car to turn it around and stop it. Right, yeah. right. And so for some reason, the guy got off the highway back onto the city streets and was wasn't driving like super crazy. Mm-hmm. And so officers um, in the Western division of our city were able to throw the stop sticks and flatten the tires. And then our SOU guys were able to do the TVI maneuver and safely get the car stopped. Um, we got him into custody and got the kid back. And yeah. I got out of my car and that adrenaline dump went away. And oh, I my was, goodness, my knee. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Oh, my goodness. My knee. Yeah, I was listening to this. Um, I was in the chaplain car listening oh. to it on the radio and not responding. Very, I was keeping clear, staying away. But uh, but yeah, I forgot that that was when you when you hurt yourself. Yeah. Um, Mercy so I've been working through that process of trying to get the treatment that I needed and going through physical therapy and a steroid shot and ultimately Meeting all the requirements before they would do surgery probably right correct yeah. Um, yeah and ultimately they decided to go ahead and authorize my surgery and lo and behold I ended up uh, having bone fragment uh, mm. floating around in my knee so uh, about two and a half weeks ago I got all that cleaned out and cleaned up and a partial knee replacement and hopefully back on the road to recovery to get back on the streets. <laughs> I am uh, missing it. Yeah, sure, sure. Now, let me ask, you You had another stop stick injury, didn't you? Those dreaded stop sticks, yes. I've, um, I've heard officers talking about and giving instruction to other officers about stop sticks and brought your name up as someone that had been bitten by the stop sticks. <laughs> I so, have been bitten by the stop sticks. Can I you describe probably, that injury? I could probably give a lesson on how to not <laughs> throw a stop sticks. Um, gosh, it's been, it was right after I started dating my now husband. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was probably 2012 Okay. Ish. Okay. Again, another officer in a different part of the city was chasing a stolen car, and I kind of went to our little prime spot um, once they get up onto the highway, um, where I knew that it was a one-lane, sharp turn. There were um, jersey barriers, cement barriers on either side, and I knew that that car was going to have to drive over those stop sticks. Mm -hmm. There was no way around it, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to stick it good. Yeah. And sure enough, here comes the car and it gets stuck and they drive over the sticks. And in the process of the car driving over the sticks, um, I went to go pull it out of the roadway. First mistake was not wearing gloves. Mm. Second mistake was grabbing the rope barehanded. And the third mistake was that the sticks got wrapped up in that stolen car's wheel well. And Mm. so it actually yanked it back through my hand that I had on the rope. And so ultimately it cut through my fingers oh, and because it mercy. was like a rope burn, it cauterized it. So I wasn't really bleeding per se, but I felt that tug right. and I knew immediately that I probably had a good cut on my hand. Yeah, it was probably over before you knew what, before you knew what happened, right? right? It's just, right. Z- that fast. Right. And I think it launched the sticks probably a good 40 yards down the highway. So I got on the radio and said, hey, can you go ahead and start me an ambulance for a laceration to my hand? And um, the sergeant at the time um, got on the radio and was like, "Are you, is that for you? And I said, yes, sir. So <laughs> another officer came up there and I had my hand in like a fist as tight right. as I could get it. And he kept saying, let me see it. Let me see it. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's bad. He goes, just let me see it. So I opened my hand and he said, oh, (laughs) the F-bomb. And immediately, like the pain just shot into my hand. And so ultimately, the and I have the scars. I actually sliced through everything but my thumb. Mm. Um, they ended up having to stitch up my index 
finger, my middle finger, and my pinky finger. Um, luckily, I didn't have to have any um, reconstruction mm. therapy or anything like that on my hand, but I currently have no feeling in my index finger. Oh, mercy. So, yeah, stop sticks are not my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me, how did you get started in law enforcement? Did you always want to be a cop? No, I didn't. When I went to college, um, I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon. Okay. I know, right? Totally different. My first year and a half of school, um, that's what I was going to do. I was studying pre-med chemistry. And my sophomore year, after I moved off campus, I moved into a house with five other girls who are still currently some of my best friends. Okay. Like 20 some odd years later. And of course... You know, living away from parents, living off campus, you know, you do the whole like college life thing and you start getting into parties. And this could be a really long story. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, you start doing that and the grades started to just kind of start to yeah, tank a little bit. Yeah. So, not the I first had... college student who has lost their focus a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. I obviously had to do some self reflection and reevaluating like, do I really want to keep my nose in the books? And also keep in mind, not only was I a full time student, but I was also a college athlete and, hmm. and a sport that is literally year round. I did track and field. So, uh, we had indoor and outdoor track. What'd you do? Um, I was a long and triple jumper. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I got started in high school, and it just kind of carry over um, to college. And yeah, I did that for four years. Okay. I was like, you know, I need to pick something easy. And I'm like, ah, psychology is easy. My roommate's taking it. She says it's fairly easy. I'll take some classes with her. And got into psychology and realized that psychology is not as easy as everybody says it is. <laughs> but where I went to school, they actually required you to take a... A minor. You had to get a minor in something else. And so I really had no idea with psychology. And so my counselor at the time recommended sociology. Hmm. They kind of go hand in hand. You sure. know, psychology is the study of the individual. Psychology is the study of the individual in society. Yep. I'm like, okay, I'll do that. No problem. So with where I went, which was Emporia State, you either focused on social work or uh, criminal justice. And so I started taking some criminal justice classes and I was like, man, this is really cool. <laughs> I, I, I think I'm kind of liking this and I'm going to be like a forensic um, like psychologist and study the people and the mind and the criminals and why they do what they do. And I was like, I'm going to go to the FBI. I'm going to be one of those high profile people. And then I'm like, oh my God, you have to sit on the stand and you have to talk in front of people. <laughs> And I know, ironically, as this sounds, um, I was very shy back then, <laughs> very shy back then. Like, I dropped every class that I had to give a speech in. I oh, took lower grades. Yeah. And, like, here's my paper, but I'm not doing the speech. I'm not doing it. And then I got into the uh, internship, the part where I needed to do an internship okay. for the criminal justice program. Um, there with the sociology department. And I ended up doing an internship with the Emporia Police Department, the Lyon County Sheriff's Department, and then with the campus police for a whole semester. And I had to document everything that okay. I saw did. So it was really cool to kind of see that aspect, yeah. to really see yeah. if that's what you really wanted to do. And I'm like, man, this is what I want to do. I want to be a cop. So long story short, I partied in college and I became a cop. <laughs> 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 so how did you end up in Kansas City? Why Kansas City, Kansas? So I actually, so I'm originally from Wichita okay. and I applied for the Wichita Police Department and I actually made it through the whole entire process all the way up to the interview with the chief of police mm -hmm. and um, come to find out. Um, and that was the only place that I applied to. I applied to, because I didn't really know anything outside Kansas. And, sure. you know, I was kind sure. of that, like, homebody kind of girl that I wanted to stay close right. um, to family. So I also applied to some Johnson County agencies, okay. um, some of the smaller ones. But I made it fairly far with the Wichita Police Department. But they ended up not hiring me okay. because in my final interview with the chief of police, um, they said that I didn't have any real life experience that I didn't seem interested because I didn't do any ride-alongs with them. And really? That, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, keep in mind, I'm literally, like, I still just graduated from college. Right, right. And the, 30, and the hiring environment at the time 
were there more applicants than oh, there were yeah. positions? Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Like hundreds. You would okay. have hundreds apply. Okay. Because exactly opposite now. Correct. Now there's it's all com- kinds of openings yes. and there's you fewer applicants. Nobody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the third reason that they gave, um, and I remember this question, is where do you see yourself in five years? Mm-hmm. And, of course, going back to what I said I wanted to do in college, as you know, I maybe saw myself going to a federal agency, doing the, the you know, psychological profiling, that kind of stuff, because I was into that at the time. Right. Um, and the reason that they gave is that they didn't want to invest their time and money into somebody that might potentially leave, leave. the department. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I get that. I see that now. Right. Um, but at the time, I was just kind of like, you didn't pick me. <laughs> I'm just a good candidate. This is what I want to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it kind of hurt the ego a little bit. So I continued applying to other departments. And in the meantime, I was still living in Emporia. So I was helping teach, actually, math and science at the high school um, and still trying to, you know, apply to different departments. Mm-hmm. And at the time where my parents lived, they lived kind of diagonally from a detective uh, there for the Wichita Police Department. And, you know, obviously being neighbors, they chit chat and talk. And he kind of kept up with kind of where I was at with, you know, trying to get on the Wichita PD. Mm -hmm. And um, I also liked CSI. I'm fascinated by what the body does when you die. Mm -hmm. And so I also was kind of intrigued with CSI. Mm -hmm. And he told my parents, well, if she wants to get into like profiling, CSI, that kind of stuff, then she needs to go to a bigger department like Mm -hmm. KCK or KC Mo. Yeah. And I'm like, I do not want to go to. Missouri, that's like out of state. That's not Kansas. That's just spoken too far. like a good Kansan. I know, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> um, and so, when I was working in the high school, obviously I was able to access their computers and and everything. And so I saw that KCK was hiring. Mm. They were doing a hiring process at that time. And I'm like, you know what? Like, I'm just going to do this. Um, I'd already gone through some of the other Johnson County agencies and not got hired because, again, at that time, there were hundreds of people trying to become police officers for, like, one, two, maybe five spots. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is it. If I don't get hired, I'm just going to go back to medical school and get in something in the medical field. If the cop thing doesn't work out, I guess you could become a doctor. I know, right? Well, actually, I was looking at like um, maybe like radiology, radiology tech, that kind of stuff. Um, And so I threw my name in the hat with KCK and came up and went through the whole process, which I think a lot of cops know that it's kind of, it's a lengthy process. It doesn't just happen overnight. And lo and behold, they they took a chance and I got hired and the rest is history. (laughs) Well, let's dive into that history just a little bit. Okay. I think that there is some nervousness for a female applicant when it comes to the the physical side of the job mm-hmm. and they probably encounter that for the first time during the academy when when you, you got to do defensive tactics and mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff mm-hmm. i mean they look at some of their fellow recruits and they're tw- some of those guys are twice their size what words of wisdom do you have for somebody who thinks well, I, can, I know i can do this academically i know i i'm interested in it professionally but i'm not so sure about having to wrestle a guy twice my size So I don't necessarily, I can't speak for all women that get into this process. I think one of the things that obviously I maybe had a kind of maybe an advantage was that I was a college athlete. And so... You were confident about the physicality. I guess, yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah, I I guess I did. And I wasn't too really worried about that. I mean, obviously, I know that you see a guy that's twice your size. I think one of the things that as a female, you have to know your strengths and weaknesses. And Mm -hmm. you have to know what you can and can't do and obviously pick up tricks along the way. Right. Um, Do you feel like that training adequately provides that for you? I think that it does. Um, Like this is how to defeat somebody that's larger than you? Yeah. I mean, you you learn the the tips or the tricks of the trade and, and you learn how to use those and to gain that advantage. And, and I think that that would help female officers in, in the long run. I think the biggest point is obviously know your boundaries and know what you can and can't do. Mm-hmm. And don't be too overconfident to just ask for help. Mm. I, think, I think that's one of the... Does pride get in the way there? I think some do. Okay. Um, 
I know I probably had that starting out that I came out and I needed to prove myself. Mm. But on the flip side, I also had male officers tell me that they didn't think I was a real officer until they saw me fight. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Yes. As a matter of fact, um, that conversation was had and literally we had we were sitting at breakfast and we had that conversation and not more than a couple minutes later, we were getting called to a disturbance mm-hmm. at a quick trip for a guy that walked in and took a case of beer and he was sitting out, out in his truck just chugging it. Oh, wow. And he was a big dude. Yeah. Big. I'm twice my size, easily. And um, before everything was said and done, myself and the other female officer that responded, there were other guys, uh, male sure. officers too, sure. um, but one ended up breaking his hand. Um, trying to get the guy out. and The officer broke his own hand? Yeah, he broke his own hand, um, striking the gentleman in the truck. <laughs> and myself and the other female officer, we were able to wrestle him out of the, the car or the truck mm-hmm. and get him into custody. I, it was just kind of like, hi, I told you so. Yeah, you know? yeah. I don't necessarily think that that's that defining moment of like, oh, the guys see me as, you know just another officer. I think that there's a totality of circumstances. Sure. But, but that's part of the equation. It is. Is it being is able to prove yourself. They, they, a cop wants to know that they can count on their fellow cops. Right. And and sometimes some, I think some officers really feel there's a, their own anxieties kind of play into that. And they're like, they're like I, I, I need to trust the people around me. And, yes. and, and it brings them a lot of security if they know they can trust. It, that it is. I, and you, I mean... You spend eight hours a day with these people, Mm -hmm. and you literally start learning the ins and outs of who they are, what they do, how they sound. And those are the people that get you home at the end of the day to go home to your home family. Um, And you really have to put a lot of faith and trust in those people. Um, And you do kind of have to prove your whether you're a male or a female, you have to you have to prove yourself that we can trust you to do that. Yeah, yeah. That's so. excellent. Uh, so, you mentioned before that that you married a coworker. I did marry a coworker. There are so many versions of that story that go wrong, and it, it's it, you know a lot of a lot of times um, cops are looking for love in all the wrong places. How did you end up with uh, a happy story? How, how did that how that work out for you? So it was it wasn't one that that came super easy. He is a little bit younger than me. Okay. Like, mm, <laughs> Almost 10 years. He's also shorter than me by like, on a good day, three and a half inches. Um, And then also another cop. So it was kind of one of those like three strikes and you're out. And some other coworkers were like, you know, he's such a good guy. He's such a good guy. And you're such a good person. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm not going to date a coworker. He's younger. He's shorter. No way. (laughs) <laughs> no way. And it was just one of those, like, we just, we hang around the same group of people mm-hmm. and we got to know each other more and more and we were around each other more and more. And I finally told another couple, another married couple on the department, I said, you really got to help this guy out because I'm a little old fashioned when it comes to dating mm-hmm. and I am not going to ask him out. I'm not going to do it. I refuse to do it. <laughs> like, I obviously, like, I like him. I'm flirting with him and vice versa. I go, but yeah. he's going to have to ask me out. Like, I'm not going to do it. So I would go over to their house typically about once a week, and we would just cook dinner and grill out and sit out on the back patio and enjoy, mm-hmm. you know, a cold drink and right. the nice weather. And it was a typical, another like, hey, let's come over for dinner, cook, drink, whatever. And I walk into the house and I see that they're cooking extra food. And I'm like, why is there so much food here? And they were like, oh, by the way, Kyle's coming over. (laughs) And I'm like, well, you could have told me I would have maybe dressed up a little bit more. Um, It's an ambush date. I know, right? So it was kind of a not so blind date, so to speak. And, you know, we ate and we sat on the back patio and, you know, drank. And I finally got to the point where I was like, hey, I got to go to work in the morning and it's getting like really late. And so, you know, he's super gentleman. He walked me out to my car and we talked for a few minutes more and he just kind of planted a little kiss on the lips and the rest is history. And we got married <laughs> literally three years to the day of our first kiss. Oh, wow. I know. Kind, yeah. of, kind of a 
a romance movie, so to speak. So, so, so what would you recommend if somebody kind of has their eyes on somebody else that they're working with? Don't do it. Right. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Don't I do mean, it. Th- this is not the normal story. Yours it's is not kind a of the exception. It, Maybe that proves the rule. So, so what should they be looking for? Or what should they be warned against? When when they're thinking, hey, I, I kind of like this guy. Do you have any advice? I think one of the things that we said from the get-go, and I even told him, I was like, you need to be prepared for the people talking. And everybody is going to gossip about this mm-hmm. because coworkers are dating. I said, you really have to kind of like tune that out. Um, because people outside influences can, you know, direct which way you go. Yeah. And that peer pressure. The second thing that I told him, I said, we can never work together. Yeah. Like we can never work together. And I want to say in the almost 10 and a half years that we have been together, I have maybe been on, I don't even think a handful of Mm. calls with him. And the times that I have been, it's, it's really weird. It's weird. Um, even is when we were both patrolmen. Yeah. Um, it was weird. Yeah. But as a supervisor, and he was a patrolman. Yeah, because you got you were further in your career than he was. You Correct. got promoted before he was. I did. Yeah. It was it was still kind of weird, you know. But we still joke about it. Um, even to this day, even though he has promoted up, and I guess technically we are the same rank. But <laughs> up until that point, I was like boss at home, boss at work. Right. <laughs> So I guess maybe that's the exception to the rule is obviously you have to like tune out the outside influences. Mm. Um, But I think, I don't know, some people do rather well when they're in a relationship and they literally work together. uh, And I do know several, I do know several happily married cop couples. Yes. But I know a lot that didn't turn out too. And so, so yeah, that's. That's so hard to know. It it is. Who um, would you listen to first? Would you listen to if you're if if you had family that voted him up or down, or coworkers that voted him up or down? Which would be more important to you? Family. Okay. Okay. Family. So if family met him and said, "Nah, not the right guy," that would that would outrank coworkers saying that. Um. Probably, probably. <laughs> it all depends on the situation. I think, I think, yeah, it does. I think it depends yeah. on the yeah. situation. Um, but fortunately, you know, like I said, we've been together for 10 and a half years, married for seven and a half. Yep. And we have two beautiful boys that, gosh darn it, man, they are the cutest kids in the world. And I know I might be biased, but man, <laughs> they're awesome little boys. I love and he that. gave you a great last name. Yes, he did. I mean, Sergeant Wolf. I, I mean, know, that right? is that's pretty good. That's, that's classic. Pretty coppish, uh, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> that's, that's pretty, pretty coppish. Hopefully, Captain Wolf here before. Too yeah, long. you're on the captain's list. I Absolutely, am. I yeah, am. That's so. awesome. So, so do you feel? I mean, so you you have your career. You're married. You've got two kids. Did any of the marriage and kids stuff significantly interfere with your career? It was law enforcement? Uh, you know, agreeable to you being a mother and a wife? What was your experience? So we obviously are in a unique situation because myself and my husband, we are not originally from Kansas City. So all of our family lives, um, well, my parents now live up here, but at the time they lived in Wichita. Like three hours away. Yes. And his family is like an hour and a half away, 40 minutes, 45 minutes to an hour and a half away. Mm -hmm. So when we finally had kids, we really had to focus our careers on, one, do we really want the child care um, and how to make that work? Um, But we were fortunate enough that at the time that we had our children, um, we were able to be on opposite shifts. Okay, I was going to ask about that. We were we yeah. were on opposite shifts. So um, he worked at night and I worked during the day and we saw um, each other in the afternoon. Okay. Um, and occasionally, um, obviously, we would have to help with some child care. So I was fortunate enough to, at the time, she opened an in-home daycare, another officer's wife. Mm. And um, we have used her since and we 
only used her when we needed her, and she has been so gracious okay. with helping us out. And I know they say it takes a village yeah. to, to have a family, and it really, really yeah. does. And I've also been blessed with um, my neighbors. We live on a cul-de-sac, and not everybody is fortunate enough to have good, good neighbors. neighbors. Yeah. And the one thing that COVID brought around was the fact that I was able to sit out in the driveway and all of us have young kids and we got to know our neighbors really, really well. And we've all helped each other out when we needed something. So they are also part of my little village for my family and they have helped us out and vice versa. My husband and I have been very, very fortunate um, to be able to work through that process. It hasn't been easy, but we have been very fortunate to have other people in our lives to help us out when certain things happen. My career has obviously been more stable than his um, because as a sergeant, I have set hours, set days off. So I know my schedule. I know when I'm going to work. I know when I'm coming home, hopefully, if I don't have a late call. He potentially was forced to overtime and stuff like that that he yes. didn't have as much control over. Yes. Right. So he was on the SWAT team for the last four and a half years. And I think he came, he went from the traffic unit, uh, motorcycle unit, okay. into the SWAT team. Um, and so obviously being in that unit, their hours changed all the time. Sometimes he got paged in when we're right. out doing stuff. But I, I have been very fortunate to have family and friends step in and help us out when we needed. Um, And then I've also been blessed with my parents moving up here in July. So (laughs) it has been Having um, a couple grandchildren is a strong incentive to get those parents to move, grandparents to move. Yeah. (laughs) I wish they would have done it sooner. Um, But... So, but but being pregnant and, and maternity leave and all that stuff in law enforcement didn't, I mean... That wasn't a huge detraction from your career. I mean, you you no. feel like that worked out pretty well. I I do. Obviously, you know, you you tell the department that hey, I'm having a kid. What's that um, like? What's um, that like to be pregnant and be a police officer at the same time? So, both situations. Um, the first one, um, I actually did it fairly quickly, um, just because I am a... You told the department quickly, you mean? Yeah, I told yeah. them fairly early on, just because I'm kind of a poop magnet, <laughs> so to speak. And I have a tendency, just things just kind of fall in my lap. And because I knew I was pregnant, I'm like, man, I really don't want to get into something. They should be aware yes. that you are with child. Right? Correct. <laughs> and so obviously you do that and they pull you off the street and they pull put you on desk duty, yeah. uh, essentially, until you have your kid. And um, I think my first kid, I was almost off for a year off the streets. Mm. Um, okay. And then um, my but second see, I think, one. I think a lot of female officers really fear that. They're like, okay, I'm my career's getting interrupted and I can't afford that. I won't make the next promotion list or whatever. Uh, do you, did you feel that pressure? I, or was that I not didn't. a concern? I, it really wasn't a concern because I was I was ready to have a family. And obviously I know that you tell the department. I think one of the things, I mean, you know obviously the time frame. And when my first son was born in April, I knew obviously I wasn't going to make our bid spot that we do every year. Comes around in December. Right. And um, so, you bid your spot for the year, and then it takes effect in January. Obviously, I knew I was going to miss that, and my son was born in April. And so, because I knew I didn't have a spot to come back to, um, again, I was fortunate enough that I took the full 12 weeks that they give us, mm-hmm. and I also, for my longevity that I've been on the department, I got so many weeks of vacation. Okay. And so, I tacked on five more weeks of vacation, so I was <laughs> off work for 17 <laughs> weeks taking care of my baby. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then and you were satisfied with that. that I was, was good. completely satisfied Excellent. with that. Okay. Um, and then uh, ended up coming back to a midnight shift. And at the time, it worked for us. It worked out rather well for us. Sure. My second one, I actually knew I was pregnant for, oh my gosh, almost eight weeks. And again, I'm a poop magnet. <laughs> 
And I was just driving down the road knowing that I'm pregnant. And I see, I pull up to the stop sign and I see this guy chasing another guy with a shovel running up this hill towards me. (laughs) And I'm like, what is going on? So I hop out and he's yelling, he just tried to steal my truck, like trying to swing the shovel at him. So obviously I get the guy at gunpoint, I get him into custody and I'm like, I really was trying to make it to, I think, almost Mother's Day in, like, May before I said something. And I'm like, man, I got to tell somebody. The swinging shovel does that. Uh, Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You're like, I should tell somebody now. Right. I should probably (laughs) tell somebody that I'm pregnant. Um, And I told another co-worker, mm-hmm. not necessarily a supervisor. I was just like, hey, I'm pregnant in case something happens. Right. And I tried to make it a couple more weeks and I'm like, man, I can't do this. I know something else is probably going to pop off and sure, I, I just don't want something to happen. Right. So right. ultimately... I ended up telling my supervisor, and of course, you know, I was like in the middle of my day, and he was like, "Yeah, they're gonna send you home, and you're gonna report here, blah blah blah." Right. So, right. but no, but it I worked out. It it did. I I don't feel any hindrance. So. Sure. Well, you are still a sergeant as we record this here, mm-hmm. and uh, you're on the captain's promotion list. So someday you may be moving up. I am. But I first noticed you as I came into the department as a chaplain because I would come into these early morning roll calls and you'd be up there leading roll call and and going through all the business that the officers needed to know. And it seems like every time I was there, there would be the roll call would end with a meme. Those and, dreaded memes of the day, man. And it was man. almost always not safe for the chaplain uh, kind of memes. <laughs> I tell you what, man, they they catch me every time. And every time you walked in, I'm like, man, you've got to give me a heads up. But sometimes they are just a little inappropriate. <laughs> Little inappropriate, but so I've embarrassed Sergeant Wolf a few times, well, you know. <laughs> well, but I, I truly, honestly feel like when I'm up there and I'm talking to the guys on my shift, obviously, it's almost I call it a mullet, like business in the front, right. party in the back, right. and you know, you get in there, you start the day, and it's all business, and you. This is what we need to do. This is what's going on. This is what we need to talk about. This Corrections is to be made and whatever. Correct. Right. right. Um, areas that we need to kind of focus on a little bit more. Um, pickups, warrant arrest, um, occasional watches, all that kind of stuff. But I, I truly, truly feel like in this profession, because for so long now, obviously probably since Ferguson, that, you know, this profession gets a bad rap mm-hmm. and you you get poo flung at you from every direction. And roll calls can be a bit rough. If a sergeant has to make some corrections, yeah. sometimes you're you're setting somebody straight. Yes. And they've made some mistakes and they have to stop making those mistakes right now. Right. And that's not a great note uh, to start your day on. <laughs> right. Right. And, you know, it's all about business in the front. But one of the things, gosh, I started it probably... Oh, gosh, probably five years ago, maybe. Sure. I was just like, you know, like, I see all these memes, and I I see them. God love Facebook. And you see funny little, like, quotes or quips or pictures with funny sayings on it. And I'm like, man, I need to, like, put that in the roll call. And I'm going to slide that into the very last thing that we talk about. Yeah, little PowerPoint presentation there. talk about for the end of the day. And I have literally, probably for the last five years, I have found a different one Every single roll call yeah. that I have given, yeah. or I give it to another sergeant on my days off that we throw in there at the end of the day, because I get that you're serious and it's all business up front. But if the one thing that I can do before you go out in service is to give a little joke or something hilarious, whether it be a dad joke, a mom joke, a blonde <laughs> joke, something inappropriate right. that the chaplain right. probably shouldn't the be The more seeing, inappropriate, the more likely the chaplain will I'm show up. I'm telling you. That's right. I'm telling you. <laughs> But if I can do that and give them a little bit of chuckle and kind of brighten their day for just that small moment before yeah. they go out there and, yeah. and deal with the general public and see stuff and hear stuff and deal with stuff that the general person doesn't see on a day-to-day basis for eight hours a day, mm-hmm. by golly, then I made you laugh for the day and I made you smile and, yeah. Yeah. and it's all worth it. 
Yeah, it, you balanced out maybe if they needed a little bit of a of a chewing out. Right. You know, you balance that out with some humor and some right. kindness, some right. lightheartedness. Right. And, you know, those uh, yeah. inappropriate ones. And I think the, the funniest <laughs> thing, the last time I think you walked into my office and I'm like, gosh, darn it, man, you need to give me a heads up. And you're like, just remember, God is always watching. <laughs> <laughs> and I try to take that into consideration, but sometimes they're just so darn funny. No, so. I don't. I, and I don't mind. I, I, I like to tease about it. Yes. But, but no, I, I, there are, it's a rough job. Yes. And these officers have to go out and do, you know, they have to be able to put their hands on people right. and, and, and do a very difficult job. Mm-hmm. And so some lightheartedness, a little bit of gallows humor sometimes. Right. It, it it's really psychologically healthy yes. for them. Yes. And so so yes, it's maybe not the one. It's maybe not the meme you would share with mom back home. Oh no, uh, I would. But <laughs> oh, I would. I would. But, but it's appropriate to the department, and I've appreciated your efforts to be lighthearted. Yes, I really have. Thank you, Toby. I yeah. appreciate you coming in today. Yeah, absolutely. I want to thank Sergeant Wolf for hobbling into my office today on her crutches to talk to me. She's a good example of some of the great people we have here in our department. But before you go, I asked her just one more question, and here it is. Tell me, uh, what is the part of law enforcement you love the most? The kids. I love it when the kids come up and they give you a hug or they give you a high five, and it's the kids. Yeah. It's the kids and the thank yous from, from... people in general um, because because of everything that's happened in the last couple of years you know you forget that there are people out there that actually appreciate you and appreciate what you do you forget that yeah. um, but man it's the kids it's the kids that come up and are happy to see police officers and want to shake your hand and give you a high five or a hug I love it and I'll go out of my way any time or day yeah. to make sure that I say hi to a kid answer any questions you want to look at my car you want to look at my equipment I will absolutely do it without question. Awesome. On the next episode of Hey Chaplain. Well, that was the first time I ever met Mossad guys. These are the uh, secret I, I, agents from Israel, I, right? The, yeah, the, yeah, these these are the, the big guns in Israel. Anyway, I see one of the guys with a gun case. And, and I think it was an automatic weapons or something. Who knew? Anyway, that night was uh, some kind of playoff games in basketball. So after everybody was settled into their rooms, a bunch of the Mossad guys came to my room and we watched a basketball, the basketball game. <laughs> sure. And I asked the guy, he says, okay, you were carrying that downstairs in the kitchen. I want to know what it is. And he said, let's put it this way. If something happens and we have to get out of the building, this will get us out that back wall. <laughs> I go, ah, okay, very nice. Yes. <laughs> and I, I just stopped the conversation there because yeah, I didn't know yeah, how that's much all we these need guys to know. wanted yep. to <laughs> say. Yeah. If you have someone that you'd like me to interview, please contact me and make a suggestion. Now, understand that I'm usually already booked for the foreseeable future, and it can be difficult to find the right topic and the right opening in both of our schedules. But I'm certainly open to suggestions, so let me know what you think. The views expressed here are the personal views of the host and our guest, and do not necessarily represent the views of any law enforcement agency or its components. Please go find Hey Chaplin on Facebook and Twitter, And please consider sharing this episode with a cop or someone who loves a cop. Thank you for listening to Hey Chaplin. And as always, pray for peace in our city. Mm